Prevention and Management of Postpartum Hemorrhage Green Top Guideline No. 52, December 2016 Primary postpartum hemorrhage is the most common form of major obstetric hemorrhage. Definition of primary postpartum hemorrhage is the loss of 500 milliliters or more of blood from the genital tract within 24 hours of the birth of a baby. Postpartum hemorrhage can be minor, 500 to 1,000 milliliters, or major, more than 1,000 milliliters. Major can be further subdivided into moderate, 1,001 to 2,000 milliliters, and severe, more than 2,000 milliliters. In women with lower body mass, for example, less than 60 kilograms, a lower level of blood loss may be clinically significant. Secondary postpartum hemorrhage is defined as abnormal or excessive bleeding from the birth canal between 24 hours and 12 weeks postnatally. Women with pre-existing bleeding disorders and women taking therapeutic anticoagulants are at an increased risk of postpartum hemorrhage. Introduction and Background Epidemiology Obstetric hemorrhage remains one of the major causes of maternal death in both developed and developing countries. The 2011 to 2013 Confidential Inquiries into Maternal Deaths and Morbidity Report identified 13 direct deaths due to obstetric hemorrhage in the UK and Ireland the report places obstetric hemorrhage as the second leading cause of direct maternal deaths. Prediction and Prevention of Postpartum Hemorrhage What are the risk factors for developing postpartum hemorrhage and how can they be minimized? The causes of postpartum hemorrhage as related to abnormalities of one or more of four basic processes, the four T's, tone, trauma, tissue, and thrombin. The most common cause of postpartum hemorrhage is uterine atony. Risk factors and the associated levels of risk for postpartum hemorrhage. Tone. Multiple pregnancy. Previous postpartum hemorrhage. Fetal macrosomia. Failure to progress in second stage. Prolonged third stage of labor and general anesthesia, thrombin, preeclampsia, tissue, retained placenta, and placenta accreta, trauma, episiotomy, and perineal laceration. Risk factors for postpartum hemorrhage may present antenatally or intrapartum. Care plans must be modified as and when risk factors arise. Women with known risk factors for PPH should only be delivered in a hospital with a blood bank on site. Minimizing risk Treating antenatal anemia Antenatal anemia should be investigated and treated appropriately as this may reduce the morbidity associated with postpartum hemorrhage. Hemoglobin levels outside the normal UK range for pregnancy 110 grams per liter at first contact and 105 grams per liter at 28 weeks should be investigated and iron supplementation considered if indicated. It is recommended that parenteral iron therapy should be considered antenatally for women with iron deficiency anemia who do not respond to oral iron. Reducing blood loss at delivery. Uterine massage is of no benefit in the prophylaxis of postpartum hemorrhage. Prophylactic uterotonics should be routinely offered in the management of the third stage of labor in all women as they reduce the risk of postpartum hemorrhage. For women without risk factors for PPH delivering vaginally, oxytocin, 10 international units by intramuscular injection, is the agent of choice for prophylaxis in the third stage of labor. A higher dose of oxytocin is unlikely to be beneficial. For women delivering by cesarean section, 
oxytocin, 5 international units by slow intravenous injection, should be used to encourage contraction of the uterus and to decrease blood loss. Ergometrine oxytocin may be used in the absence of hypertension in women at increased risk of hemorrhage as it reduces the risk of minor postpartum hemorrhage, 500 to 1,000 milliliters. For women at increased risk of hemorrhage, it is possible that a combination of preventative measures might be superior to syntocinon alone to prevent postpartum hemorrhage. Clinicians should consider the use of intravenous tranexamic acid, 0.5 to 1.0 grams, in addition to oxytocin, at cesarean section to reduce blood loss in women at increased risk of postpartum hemorrhage. Management of postpartum hemorrhage. Identification of the severity of hemorrhage. Clinicians should be aware that the physiological increase in circulating blood volume during pregnancy means that the signs of hypovolemic shock become less sensitive in pregnancy. In pregnancy, pulse and blood pressure are usually maintained in the normal range until blood loss exceeds 1,000 milliliters. Tachycardia, tachypnea, and a slight recordable fall in systolic blood pressure occur with blood loss of 1,000 to 1,500 milliliters. A systolic blood pressure below 80 millimeters of mercury associated with worsening tachycardia, tachypnea, and altered mental state usually indicates a postpartum hemorrhage in excess of 1,500 milliliters. Clinicians should be aware that the visual estimation of peripartum blood loss is inaccurate and that clinical signs and symptoms should be included in the assessment of postpartum hemorrhage. Communication and Multidisciplinary Care Communication with the woman Communication with the patient and her birthing partner is important and clear information of what is happening should be given from the outset. Postpartum hemorrhage often occurs unexpectedly and can be very stressful for the woman and her partner or birth attendants. It is crucial that where feasible, they are kept informed and reassured, if appropriate, of the clinical development and proposed management. Who should be informed when the woman presents with postpartum hemorrhage? Early involvement of appropriate senior staff including the anesthetic team and laboratory specialists, is fundamental to the management of postpartum hemorrhage. In minor postpartum hemorrhage, the first-line staff should be alerted, and in major postpartum hemorrhage, the following members of staff should be called and summoned to attend. An experienced midwife, in addition to the midwife in charge, the obstetric middle grade, the anesthetic middle grade, the on-call clinical hematologist with experience in major hemorrhage, and porters for delivery of specimens or blood. The midwife in charge and the first-line obstetric and anesthetic staff should be alerted when women present with minor postpartum hemorrhage or a blood loss of 500 to 1,000 milliliters without clinical shock. Furthermore, the consultant obstetrician and consultant anesthetist should be alerted and the blood transfusion laboratory should be informed. One member of the team should be assigned the task of recording events, fluids, drugs, blood and components transfused, and vital signs. A multidisciplinary team involving senior members of staff should be summoned to attend to women with major postpartum hemorrhage or a blood loss of more than 1,000 milliliters and ongoing bleeding or clinical shock. Clinicians and blood transfusion staff should liaise at a local level to agree a standard form of words such as we need compatible blood now or group-specific blood to be used in cases of major obstetric hemorrhage and a time scale in which to deliver various blood components. The use of the term controlled major obstetric hemorrhage or ongoing major obstetric hemorrhage may be used to define the urgency to the team. Senior obstetric staff must be receptive to concerns expressed by less experienced 
or junior medical practitioners and by midwives. The Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommends that the consultant obstetrician should attend in person when there is a PPH of more than 1,500 milliliters where the hemorrhage is continuing. Resuscitation Measures for Minor Postpartum Hemorrhage Measures for minor postpartum hemorrhage or a blood loss of 500 to 1,000 milliliters without clinical shock. Intravenous access, 1 14 gauge cannula, urgent venipuncture, 20 milliliters, 4 group and screen, full blood count, and coagulation screen including fibrinogen, pulse respiratory rate, and blood pressure recording every 15 minutes, and commence warmed crystalloid infusion. Measures for major postpartum hemorrhage. Full protocol for major postpartum hemorrhage or a blood loss greater than 1,000 milliliters and continuing to bleed or clinical shock. A and B, assess airway and breathing. C, evaluate circulation. Position the patient flat. Keep the woman warm using appropriate available measures. Transfuse blood as soon as possible if clinically required. Until blood is available, infuse up to 3.5 liters of warmed clear fluids, initially 2 liters of warmed isotonic crystalloid. Further fluid resuscitation can continue with additional isotonic crystalloid or colloid, such as succinylated gelatin. Hydroxyethyl starch should not be used. The best equipment available should be used to achieve rapid warmed infusion of fluids. Special blood filters should not be used as they slow infusions. A high concentration of oxygen, 10 to 15 liters per minute, via a face mask should be administered regardless of maternal oxygen concentration. If the airway is compromised owing to impaired conscious level, Anesthetic assistance should be sought urgently. Usually, level of consciousness and airway control improve rapidly once the circulating volume is restored. Establish two 14-gauge intravenous lines. A 20 ml blood sample should be taken and sent for diagnostic tests including full blood count, coagulation screen, urea and electrolytes, and to cross-match pack red cells of 4 units. The urgency and measures undertaken to resuscitate and arrest hemorrhage need to be tailored to the degree of shock. The cornerstones of resuscitation during PPH are restoration of both blood volume and oxygen-carrying capacity. Volume replacement must be undertaken on the basis that blood loss is often underestimated. The British Committee for Standards in Hematology summarizes the main therapeutic goals of the management of massive blood loss as maintaining hemoglobin greater than 80 grams per liter, platelet count greater than 50 multiplied by 10 to the 9 power per liter, protrombin time or PT less than 1.5 times normal, Activated partial thromboplastin time or APTT less than 1.5 times normal and fibrinogen greater than 2 grams per liter. Fluid replacement. Fluid replacement is a crucial component of postpartum hemorrhage treatment although a dilutional coagulopathy may occur when large volumes of crystalloid, colloid or red cells are used with insufficient transfusion of fresh frozen plasma in platelets. Fluid therapy and blood product transfusion. Crystalloid. Up to 2 liters isotonic crystalloid. Colloid. Up to 1.5 liters of colloid until blood arrives. Blood. If immediate transfusion is indicated, give emergency group O, rhesus T, or RHT negative. K negative red cell units. Switch to group specific red cells as soon as feasible. Fresh frozen plasma or FFP. 
administration of fresh frozen plasma should be guided by hemostatic testing and whether hemorrhage is continuing. If a prothrombin time or activated partial thromboplastin time are prolonged and hemorrhage is ongoing, administer 12 to 15 milliliters per kilogram of FFP. If hemorrhage continues after 4 units of red blood cells and hemostatic tests are unavailable, administer 4 units of fresh frozen plasma. Platelet concentrates. Administer 1 pool of platelets if hemorrhage is ongoing and platelet count is less than 75, multiply by 10 to the 9th power per liter. Cryoprecipitate. Administer 2 pools of cryoprecipitate if hemorrhage is ongoing and fibrinogen is less than 2 grams per liter.